winning in manufacturing uh, in 2022 and beyond. This webinar is tied to our manufacturing and industrial deal connect where we're pairing up capital providers and investment bankers for one-on-one -on -one meetings after this. So we appreciate you uh, hanging out with us for this next hour. Uh, for those of you I have not had the opportunity to meet, my name is Lena Dobreer. I'm the Director of Operations at Opus Connect. We are a lower middle and middle market M&A focused organization. We cater to transactional professionals in this space, um, private equity firms, investment bankers, lenders. We're a membership based organization. So that's uh, uh, those are our members. Um, we have a number of different events going on throughout the year. I think we're doing close to 350 events now since COVID, since we can work things in virtually. So a lot of different formats and ways for people to get involved um, so we can help with your business development needs or just networking in this space uh, with like-minded individuals. So definitely reach out to myself or any one of my colleagues, Swayze Yancey in particular, his contact information is below. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, today, we are going to take Q&A. So, the way that you'll be able to participate in that is through written Q&A. You'll see a Q&A bubble at the bottom of your screen. I will ask that you refrain from using the chat function. We won't be monitoring that or engaging in there. So please go ahead and submit your questions in the Q&A bubble, and we will get to as many as possible throughout the discussion. Um, we do have a poll question for you today. We want to get an idea of who's in the room. And we're actually not going to ask the in-person one because I think we've 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 beaten that to death. But we're going to go ahead and ask, "Who are you? Which best describes you?" I'll go ahead and launch that myself. Um, so you should see a, a box pop up there on your screen. We want to know: Are you a capital provider on the debt or the equity side? Uh, independent sponsor, investment banker, service provider, or other? Let us know. We'll give it about twenty seconds here, and then we'll move forward. Okay, wrap it up in about five seconds here. So it looks like 38% uh, capital provider equity side, 8% uh, independent sponsor, 38% investment banker, 8% service provider and 8% other, which makes sense. I'm sure many of you are participating in the meetings later. Um, so thank you very much for participating in that. I want to give a shout out to today's sponsor, Plant Moran. They've done a number of events with us. Uh, they've become good friends and partners uh, over the last couple of years. And we're really excited to have uh, Ted Morgan from Plant Moran kind of lead today's discussion. They have quite the robust uh, private equity practice. And so I'll kick it over to Ted. He's got 20 plus years in this space, uh, specific uh, expertise in manufacturing and, and plastics, and he'll get into all of that. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ted Morgan. Ted, the floor is yours. Lena, thank you. Thank you everyone for hanging out with us. Uh, esteemed panelists, thanks thanks for uh, spending some time uh, getting ready for this, this call as well. Um, so yeah, quick background. Uh, I'm a partner in our, our strategy and operations consulting practice at, at Plant Moran. Um, been in manufacturing for 20 years and really through a variety of roles. I kind of started accounting finance, then went to sales, program management, product launch, and then ultimately market strategy um, for very, very large companies, publicly traded Fortune 500 to very small companies, $20 million kind of mom and pop manufacturing companies. So kind of that diversity. Uh, I'm a Detroit guy. Uh, that means I am a, kind of a, I'm a car guy. So I don't apologize for that. I'm kind of old school. Um, but uh, yeah, so, be, so obviously spent a lot of time in the, in the auto industry before coming to Plant Moran. Um, and then beyond that, my industry experience kind of stems to, uh, beyond, you know, to recreational products and construction and ag, heavy truck, those type of markets. So uh, that's a little background on me. Um, what we'll kind of do today, we'll kind of do some some intros here. We're kind of this kind of your, your, your typical panel, right? We'll, we'll try to keep this light and uh, uh, keep it not take ourselves not too seriously, right? So maybe get out of here a little bit early. So um, a little bit on the firm before I kick it over to a panelist, I'll say plant. Um, we were they're also a Detroit based firm started in UC in 1924. So kind of the, the first 50 years, right? It's kind of traditional audit and tax shop. And then the last 
48. It's really transitioned to much more of this full service business advisory firm. So um, in the context of our private equity practice, which is one of our larger practices in the firm, we we are working with a lot of, uh, you know, several hundred private equity clients that are, you know, acquiring a lot of manufacturers as well as business services and healthcare companies. But certainly with our roots in, um, in, in Detroit, uh, certainly it's been a key focus area uh, for us as industrials and manufacturing. Um, dots on the map, we're about, uh, about 25 offices around the world, heavily based in, in the Midwest as well as Rocky Mountain region. Um, and I think as we come to market, we, we pride ourselves in having a, a pretty holistic approach in terms of what we can do with a centralized operating structure, which is different from firms of our size. We're 3,300 3, folks, and uh, our offices are not profit centers, they're actually cost centers. We, so we work together pretty well individually or as offices to bring the, suite, the full suite of what we do uh, to our great clients. So that's a lot on me. That's a little bit on Plant Moran. Um, why don't we start, uh, Shank, are you at the top of my screen? Could you start us off? Mr. Stellex. Uh, good morning, everyone. Great to be on this panel with uh, all of you and my um, uh, panel participants as well. I'm an operating partner at Stellex. Stellex is a $2.7 billion um, middle market private equity fund. The founders come from Carlisle. They've been investing for a long time with a very good track record. I actually worked for them as a CFO in one of their portfolio companies in automotive. Um, in a very difficult time in 08, 09. And that was, um, uh, we were at the right place at the right time, was a very successful investment. And since that time, I've worked with other private equity firms and I frankly feel like I've come back home. So I've been back with um, the same founders from Carlisle that started Stellex. So I've been with them now three years. I started the Detroit office. And my role is to really look at uh, diligence for new platform companies, as well as operational improvements. And we have 16 plus portfolio companies and we partner with firms like Plant Moran and Ted Morgan to help us scale. Um, we um, believe in true operational transformation rather than financial engineering. So the nuts and bolts of manufacturing I personally am an engineer. I started my career 35 years ago as a plant engineer, manufacturing engineer, and I've been a part of many turnarounds. Great to meet you. Thanks, and nice to be here. Great. Thanks, Shankar. Maybe go Jesse next. Certainly. Thanks again, uh, Ted and, and the Opus folks for, for having me and, and inviting us to, to speak. Excited to to be here. Um, this particular Opus conference is, is of interest to, to Artemis given our area's uh, focus. Um, so I've been at Artemis now for about three years and Artemis is a capital provider. We're a private equity firm um, that focuses exclusively on industrial technology companies. So those that um, manufacture some sort of differentiated um, you know, product or formulation specifically around sensors and instrumentation, chemicals, advanced materials, things of that sort. Basically anything that is highly engineered, high precision in nature that's serving um, you know, a mission critical application and markets like aerospace, defense, um, medical, life sciences, uh, building products and infrastructure, things of that sort. Um, Myself, I, I oversee and kind of lead our business development efforts, meaning identifying companies that would be good fits for us to, to work with and, and, and partner with. I think that word partner has been pretty butchered uh, over the last few years, but um, you know, we are those, we're, we're pretty hands-on in terms of the type of investors that we are. Um, you know, a lot of operational background on the team, actually working in companies that, uh, that the type of companies that we we acquire our, our founder as a former operator, as an example, and try to bring that um, you know peer-to-peer, engineer-to-engineer competency to conversations with sellers, um, you know, to to display the sort of importance and and, and responsibility that comes with buying a business. Um, and so, you know, it's an area that we're we're very focused and, and passionate about, and, and excited to to be here and, and help answer some questions and, and participate in the, uh, the panel. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, 
guessing that's a lead in for me. So I, uh, <laughs> yes. so I am uh, floor is yours. Chris Carlson. I'm with the uh, CVF Capital Partners. We're an SBIC fund up in Davis, California. Uh, we've been around since 2005. We're on our third fund right now. And um, kind of the mission statement of the fund from the first one through the third one was uh, investing in underserved markets, um, kind of the, the whole ESG angle right now. But uh, that just naturally kind of brings us into the manufacturing space just on the markets that we're looking at in California and the Western United States. Um, and so we, we've had a lot of experience with, um, you know, several different sectors. We had a uh, material recovery facilities up in the Northwest, which we just exited, uh, the recycling company. We've done some uh, heavy machining down in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, we're in a casino chair manufacturing company, which is a little bit lighter manufacturing process. And really our, our goal when we kind of find one of these deals for one is to kind of back a strong management team that has experience in manufacturing and then uh, focus more on um, cost efficiencies and uh, running the business in a um, kind of light growth, but heavy on um, cost efficient practices. And it's gone well so far. Uh, we're on the third fund. As I said, we're in our final year of the investment period, and we're going to be fundraising for the fourth fund later this year. So, um, you know, once again, thanks uh, everyone here on the Opus Connect team and my fellow panelists, and I'm happy to join. Great. Thank you, Chris. All right. I think that kind of gets us through our, our X's and O's. Okay. So, uh, you know, the nice thing about this event, what's great about Opus, right? They do this thing, everything is so niche, right? So this everyone on this call, they're gonna be sold that manufacturing actually is is a is a good industry to be in. I think often with times we kind of think it's a you know, have to defend it, you know, it's a dirty word figuratively and literally, right? So um, but I, I think uh, we're all here because it kicks off a lot of good uh, sustainable cash flow across a heck of a, a big, you know, middle market. So I think as, as myself and Jesse and Chris and Shankar talk like, all right, like how can we make this kind of interesting? So, um, you know, in manufacturing, we kind of can't not talk about the human capital side. So we'll try to bring some like just some practical elements of like, how are all these great PE firms on the, on the phone on, the, on our call here kind of addressing that like today? Uh, it's changed a lot since COVID. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, and then we'll also kind of get into the, like, you know, ESG a little bit towards the end, like, what is that? Um, so some of it's a buzzword, others are like going all in. So we'll try to, you know, keep this kind of fresh and on topics that we're trying to all figure out together. Industry 4.0, those types of things. Um, I think we tend to be pretty practical foursome here. So um, I think we'll we'll try to make it very practical. So I guess to kick it off, um, to kind of level set, right? I guess we'll kind of, we'll kind of start with just like in general, how you, you know, we'll go, let's go deal activity and kind of where are you seeing things? I think we had a call, you know, we did have a call, but we kind of talked about all these scary trends and things you read in the paper, but like, um, you know, I think from a macro level, the only one that that's really, I think most driving us with size wars and, you know, um, and, and crazy politicians per se, um, it is interest rates, right? So maybe, could you guys kind of give a context? How's the year going? We kind of got, you know, four months left. We kind of talked about first half and then kind of second half and all the noise, if you will, at the, the high level. But how's your year going? What are you seeing in the market? Busy, slow. How's your fourth quarter looking? We'll start with, uh, we'll start with Jesse. Great. Happy to, uh, to jump in here. So for much of, of 2022, it felt like a continuation of 21 in terms of um, just activity there may have been a slight lull in January with you know third party providers catching their breath and everyone else in the deal community just you know coming up for air given uh, the chaos of, of December but uh, it seemed to pick up right thereafter in terms of new deals coming to market um, quality deals coming to market uh, cutting across a variety of industries while we specialize in industrial tech as I mentioned you know we still see a lot of other businesses that are outside that area um, However, you know, it seems to have tweaked, just changed a little bit. You know, I think it's frankly more uh, uh, familiar in terms of the summertime lull, just a little bit of less activity coming into the July and August timeframe when the M&A world used to, you know, partially shut down, it felt like, um, yeah. you know, getting up to the sort of post-Labor Day, uh, 
blitz, if you will, of companies coming to market. And I've heard a lot of people saying just that, you know, for Labor Day. Um, I, I, as I said to the, you know, four of us earlier, I still think it's a very good time to be a business owner and sell a business. Um, you know, there's, there's, while there's larger macro conditions that may or may not be kind of affecting the, the general economy as far as the MA world goes, there's still a lot of buyers, there's still a lot of, you know, active buyers eager to find good assets. And, um, you know, I don't think that's going to, to change any time in the next, say, you know, three to, to six months. We haven't seen personally um, the rate hikes affect our debt uh, or ability to get debt for our companies, but um, you know that does feel like something that will uh, change uh, eventually. But uh, the, the general message here has been a very busy year, um, has seemed to slow a little bit from the chaos of last, and um, you know we're kind of looking at it in six month increments, and we feel like the next six months are still going to be be pretty active and. Um, you know, it's still good to be in the, the M&A space. Well, well, yeah, for sure. And I'm like one thing we all we do back to the macro level stuff with inflation. I mean, people are traveling and a lot of our friends, a lot of folks at Plan Moran, you guys are like people are getting out and about. So they, they definitely we saw a bit of a summer, summer softening. But we're right there with you, Jesse, in terms of like we, you know, we do 500 due diligence a year. So we we saw a little just a little bit of a dip, but it's it is back on tight now. Um, Chris. Perspectives, my friend. Uh, I'll, I'll try to avoid being repetitive, but, but I, I agree with a lot of what Jesse just said. I mean, it, it, it seems like these summer vacations have come back again and just you're losing people for a couple weeks at a time. I, I will say probably some of the trickiness we've seen coming out of 21 and even uh, COVID was just kind of how you look at the business. Uh, either you're coming off a nice little spike from a COVID related business or something that had some tailwinds from the pandemic. And then you're also dealing with some just normalization that the owner is looking for just, um, you know, for one off events, you would say it's a supply chain issue, which I think we might dive into a little bit more uh, later on, but uh, just some trickiness that has kind of created some challenges when we're pricing a deal, uh, more or less, you know, we do the traditional um, a TTM, a, a multiple attached to it. And during diligence, we've had some longer diligence periods right now, just in terms of getting vendors lined up and trying to close a deal and just, you know, go, going through every box this time around too. And sometimes that involves some rep and warranty insurance during the course of the deal, which will extend it a little bit more. If we're getting a bank involved. Now they have a little bit of a longer process as well. And just that time frame. Uh, can drag out a deal, and then suddenly we start seeing some some months fall off after we hit their uh, the measurement date. And so we we had one fall off recently, and it's just because of that that it just is too much of an adjustment. Mm -hmm. And despite asking for a normalization because of supply chain creep, uh, we just couldn't get the deal done the way it was penciled. And and they were not interested either because you're still dealing with a seller that is. Um, has expectations for 2020 and 2021 and 2019. Um, you want the big payday. Yeah, exactly. Right. They heard their buddy got it. And, oh, I want to get out of that multiple. I'm, I can hold it a little bit longer. Um, so you're dealing with that or you're dealing with somebody who wants to leave right away because they're tired and they just don't want to run the business anymore. So either way, you're dealing with a tricky situation. Um, but flow wise, deal flow, I think it's it's been picking up again. Um, we had a lull at the beginning of the year. It seemed like it maybe extended a little bit longer this year into February and then a nice rush. And then we're kind of coming back out of the summer pause again. So I um, staying busy, but it's just some of the some of the uh, variables are making it challenging to close more deals. Well, you just think about like how long we talk about how much like how many trillions of dollars are investable. Like the, the ecosystem is so um it's it, it's it's pretty solid, right? For all these things, so just even a, a pullback still means that Chris are going to be busy. And we're gonna, it's just the, the flywheel, whatever the analogy you want to use. Shankar, take us home here if you could. Um, Why is that? Like maybe some more like the operational stuff we talked about on our call, kind of how you know Stellex, of course, how's how's the year gone, flow and things like that. But take us down to the upside, and also if you could comment on kind of you how you're talking about debt and equity variables on deal execution, because we'll, we'll transition next into some just a about five minutes into deal execution aspects, but so you can kind of kick us off on that as well. Okay. As you, great. Okay. Um, so Stellex is in aerospace, defense, transportation, logistics, distribution, 
automotive, industrial services. So it's pretty broad, but there's also quite a bit that we don't do. Our deal activity has stayed strong. But as we covered between us before, the deals are taking longer to process. And mm -hmm. one of the key elements is the operational diligence has become a pretty key element. Before it was check the box, get your QFP done, get all your environmental legal tax, right? But now we are doing quality of operations. So that's a uh, either internally or through external partnerships. And we are putting in a plan up front. So when we get into the business, we know what to expect. So that's taking a little bit longer. With the rising interest rate environments that Ted's talking about, the debt to equity ratios are changing. It's actually changing the valuations. And um, you know we've had some seller pause. I'm not saying that it's slowing down the deals or um, keeping it from happening. We've done a handful of deals, platform deals uh, in the first half of the year. Uh, we have enough in our, um, uh, you know, in our stream, work stream for the same amount for the second half. We've done a number of bolt-on deals. So I feel like, you know, there is uh, certainly going to be deals getting done, but they are, we are getting into perhaps a more challenging environment. So as Ted was talking about moving into the manufacturing phase, that's where I think we are trying to get into how we execute on these companies and how we set this up um, right in the first place. Do you want me to continue, Ted, or you want to ask a question about manufacturing or? No, yeah, probably good. Let's put a pin in that, Shankar. And I'll just say, um, I know we talked about it on our prep panel, but it just it's now to hear you guys say it again, it's making me think like, you know, how many, you know, how many times, like sometimes we go, you know, you guys are competing in deal in deals, and sometimes you may be the one saying this, but like, hey, we like speed to close, we get this in close quick. And we're doing about 500 a year. Like it just seems like as I hear you guys talk, like, yeah, there's like there just aren't that many. There's like, hey, we're gonna jam this thing in in four or six weeks and we're gonna make this like it's all extended. So many stop starts. But so period. And then there's just almost no stories of that 500 where it's just like, oh yeah, we like, we got that in and you know, some, some buyers, sellers, they just do this quickly. So, so let's, let's, we could probably move on. Um, okay. Let's talk about, let's see how we're doing at time. Um, let's go down, let's go real world. So let's, let's kind of like go into some of the, you know, back, back down to earth. Okay. So let's talk about how things are, you know, being, you know, happening at your portfolios that are actually driving EBITDA. Um, let's go culture first. And, you know, we know that all of us, whether you're a professional services like a firm like us, a private equity firm like you guys are, or a manufacturer, like we are like rolling out the red carpets for our respective teams, um, all the way top down. Right. So what can you tell us kind of new, this one, like how you get around like recruiting or retention? I just think it's an easy share for all of us to kind of go around. Um, and I, yeah, Shankar, why don't we go with you first to take it, lead us off where you left off. Yeah, I'll start with the human capital first, Ted. Um, we've heard about challenges retaining employees everywhere. And some of the things we have done for employee retention and engagement, as an example, is no more on-the-job training. What happens with that is the supervisor throws the guy on the floor and expects him to know what the supervisor is doing and has not really gone into the employee feels like he knows what to do, he or she knows what to do gets measured on the right things and actually feels a certain sense of purpose to how everything flows through the plan. So many people are leaving just because they are just not finding the job satisfaction with what they do on a daily basis or with their uh, supervisors or with the plant as a whole. So excessive communications, um, we are focusing more on training and we've changed shift patterns. So we have a uh, shift pattern coming up in our companies where people can plan their vacations three months ahead of time. And they have a schedule, they can say, you can be three on and four on. So we can work three 12 shifts, four 12 shifts. For the next three to six months, you have certain levels of predictability, which is especially in, important in an environment where customer schedules are changing daily. So they don't want to be treated. They don't want to have a yin yang. They don't want all the, all the uh, variations flow into their personal lives. And that's made a pretty dramatic impact. And the last thing I would say is there are different incentive programs today rather than the traditional employee incentive programs, such as we have a new innovative program called Go Home, which is all about work-life balance. So employees want to put in the time, but they don't want to stay longer than they have to, especially 
you know, they are out enjoying the good weather or wanting to spend time with the family, go hunting, whatever else that they want to do. So now we've got programs where if they meet a certain productivity goal, they can actually do that. So I'll stop there, pause and see if you. I mean, how, like, look how far we've come, right? Like what, like, what would Henry Ford say right now? <laughs> like, 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 I'm not sure that that's what Ford Motor Company was doing, you know, when they're building Model C. Where were like, the days but, when I started work, Ted, people just wanted overtime. They would work 80 hours a week if we could give right, it, but nobody right. wants that now. And so now, yeah, so you, you can just unravel that, right? But it is like, we're not, yeah, we're not talking about executives of manufacturing, we're talking about hourly staff, right? So I, I think it's just, it's just isn't it crazy that this the sound bites here, but um, okay. So with that, I guess, so the, on, let me zing one question past you, Sankar. So like onboarding, that's, that's a nice HR term that, you know, certainly within the professional world, we all know, but like, are you, is Stellox doing that within the portfolio? Is like more formal, like to help you? Cause you know, like attrition at like the first 30 days or 60 days for an hourly person is like very high. So are you guys doing that at the hourly level? You betcha. And onboarding is not one day or 30 days. We have a new concept that we call stay interviews. So it's not exit no. interviews. So we are oh, saying stay interviews? Stay interviews. So why are you staying? What do you want uh, to see so you can continue to stay? And we're doing the 30, 60, 90 days and we are giving bonuses. We are actually giving them stay bonuses. <laughs> so right. this is it's, uh, it's pretty much here and now. Okay, thanks for that, Shankar. Plenty to react to. Jesse, let it rip a little bit on some of that. Just to bend human capital. What what is um, what's Artemis doing around that within the portfolio? So, um, like virtually every single company, definitely in the United States and perhaps on Earth, uh, labor is a pretty much number one problem, or challenge, whatever word you want to use. Um, our companies are no different, and you know. There was this big, as we all saw, you know, the push to just increase compensation, right? Paying more for people's relocation fees, paying them a higher salary, giving them a bigger salary uh, uh, signing bonus. And, you know, that is not necessarily what's going to keep people working somewhere longer term. We've seen that firsthand. You have also, you know, heard it anecdotally. It's actually not a... Um, the most effective retention tool. It comes back to similar to what Shankar was alluding to, quality of life, um, culture at these different companies. Do you like where you work? Do you like the people you're working with? Do you feel like there is a longer term um, sort of development plan of where you're going to be in two or three years from now? That seems to be a very um, much more pressing issue for anyone from, you know, middle management to executives to, to hourly wages. And, you know, as a, a new buyer, it, it's, it's one of the many challenges you need to address right out of the gates. It, it's something that, you know, we have in terms of ways of, of, of actually dealing with that, it's, it's really starting with the company culture first. In other words, not screwing up and made the business great in the first place. There are different ways to go about doing that and there are different ways to, to, address that but you know it's similar to um it's frankly like we call it a listening tour uh, but yeah, it's really yeah. hearing what people actually want from the company what they like about it now what they would you know could like to see it do better um and they will and tell so, you right well some feel comfortable with it. it's funny if you, different right that's true country, that's true like different parts of the country will uh and not to like sort of generalize but people in vermont for some reason we have too <laughs> they are very willing to be honest with you they, they'll tell you how it is right out of the gates we have a company in california that they've been a bit more diplomatic um more sort of reserved in terms of how they've been willing to share and that again that's just our anecdotal experience yeah, that's your that's your portfolio yes um it's it's been interesting to see the the reactions to that kind of questioning and 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 um you know just desire to to learn, but you know, each company is different and takes on a different personality of its own. I'm not going to drone on here, but like, you know, it's it's doubling down on the stuff that they did well. Like, I'll take our Omega uh, Optical example. That's a company we have in Vermont. They have this monthly newsletter that, like, you would it, the engagement from the employees is like just 
stunning and do more of that. You know what I mean? Like right. that doesn't help our EBITDA. It doesn't help, you know, pay down debt. It doesn't have, like, you have to really put all those things, private equity firms aside and, and really think of yourself as a, as a company builder. Um, if you want to actually get that long-term retained talent that wants to be there and wants to contribute, it feels like they're working towards something. Last thing I'll say is we, um, you know, our, our sort of investment philosophy is really built around like serving a, a human demand trend. And there's, there's five that we really play on, but it's trying to get to the core of what this business thinks of itself. Like what do they mm -hmm. think they're doing to help, whether it be, you know, making us more secure or making sure. us more yeah, healthy. Some and, and, purpose. You know, trying to um, encourage and champion that at the organization and, and foster ways to increase that sort of feeling of camaraderie around a common goal. Um, it's stuff like that, which is easier said than done, but that's what we've tried to, among some other like actual programs we put in place, but th that's what we've done to really try and, um, you know, address the the challenge that is all things labor right now. No, th th good color, right? I mean, sounds like, you know, Shane Carr's doing the same thing at, their, at, at Stellax with a what, 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 giving people a sense of purpose. Um, I definitely want to get this into an ESG discussion, uh, but not quite yet, because Chris, unpack a bunch of that. You got a bunch you can react to or throw some more logs in the fire. Yeah, no, no it, it's a lot of good content. I mean, I honestly, I could probably sit here and listen to a couple of them and pull some ideas from them, apply them to our company. I'm taking some notes. I really have. <laughs> it, it's been a mixed bag. I mean, I, I'd say we try and do all these um, uh, retention driven activities, you know, mm -hmm. we'll, um, and frankly, we, we have better success in some companies that just have a, a culture where, let's say, our smaller manufacturing company down in a rural market in Eugene, they just, it's an older workforce, uh, less likely to kind of jump transition sure. between jobs at different companies. That one, it's been um, more of a traditional mindset. I mean, certainly the office, uh, the C-suite, the office, we've had some people come and go uh, and we've been encouraging, you know, shift changes, remote work when it's applicable. Um, and, you know, we we instituted a weekend shift in order to try and retain some people, but we just found productivity kind of dropped once you, uh, we didn't have great supervisors for the weekend shift. So that was one we kind of scaled back actually uh, in order to kind of maintain our profitability. But uh, if if I just go down the line, I mean, our recycling company used a staffing company and for them just finding bodies was always a challenge. And it wasn't so much the pay, which you do have to increase it, especially in that industry, but it was, it was more the work. It was, uh, pulling trash and recycled content from a waste stream, uh, single can uh, yeah. recycled content. So it it's not a great job. I mean, it, it's a very uh, tough job, but um, the only way to attract talent there was really just increased pay. And ultimately the, the, what we did in kind of the um, softer side, I guess, would be to promote from within. So to the extent we had standout employees that were managing the line, uh, we'd promote them up. And eventually they became plant managers uh, just through, you know, retention and then promoting. And, and it's worked out really well for us just to try and show that there is a pathway to growth within the company. Um, but frankly, that that was one where we could lose somebody if somebody down the street paid an extra buck an hour. And it's, it's just a constant uh, kind of rat race to kind of move that number up. But, um, you know, and then it, to kind of move into the onshoring or, um, kind of, um, I guess, finding employees in competitive markets. I mean, our company up in Reno, Nevada, the wage rates have gone up. We've increased them, but we're also dealing with competitors that have a lower cost structure just on where they are uh, geographically and and finding talent in some of these markets that can handle a lot of the manual sewing that's required for the manufacturing process was extremely difficult. And so for that specific company we are looking at actually an onboarding down into uh, Mexico and just that alone has been, has been a huge project because trying to find a location in Tijuana right now is extremely competitive we're in the final three for two bids um, for two locations and we're using a third party to manage the operations mm -hmm. down there but you know it's a little bit of a leap of faith on how that will go and I, I think our preference would be to just keep everything in Reno but uh, we just cannot find the sewers. To so you do can't the find the sewers. And then I, I wasn't there getting into real estate, but I cannot ask like your Tijuana like story. Like 
So, so you're, you're in final two or three to just to get the facility, right? Just to get the facility. I mean, right. Then you gotta get the people, right? Yeah. Like, how, so that's interesting on, on the, on the real estate side of Tijuana. Like, how do you feel, how do you guys, as you contemplate that move, like feel about the, the labor force down there? So we, we are, uh, we're, we're looking for a very high quality manager to manage that operations. And we're going to train them up in Reno um, and then probably shadow him with some existing employees sure. down in New Mexico for a time being. And I will say the, the applicants for the manager position are um, almost overqualified for what we were looking for. And we think it, it's going to be a great hire for that spot. Uh, but there's still risk. I mean, it, it's not the same oversight that we're going to have in Reno. Right. So in that job where it's highly custom work, are you going to get the same product coming out of the facility? Right. So we're, we're, we're exploring it. It's just, uh, um, it was one way we could try and address, I guess, the, the lack of labor. Okay. So let me, let me shift, let's get to down a little bit more nuts and bolts. Thanks guys. The super dynamic conversation on the people side. Let's go to some good old working capital stuff. So um, let's start it off. Well, we'll go before we we'll go supply chain. So we did have a question come in. I think Jesse was starting to, to type an answer in it, but let's, because it was one of our topics. Um, so thanks for asking the question. It was around onshoring. So again, practical. We all know what it is, um, but give us a sense for what it's meant to your businesses across your portfolio. Shankar, start us off if you could. So one of our distribution businesses um, that was sourcing products from uh, Asia is shutting down. Um, and the customers for that business is bringing that work onshore. And they have given us a choice. We can either manufacture it ourselves or find another solution that, uh, you know, um, would give them. And by the way, they are asking for the same cost, like if it's possible. Um, so that's kind of challenge. Yeah, exactly. Right. So that's the kind of challenge we are really facing in terms of the customers are getting really, really difficult. And, uh, and we have to be pretty creative and meet their quality delivery requirements and along with cost. So that's something that we haven't completely nailed, but it's a challenge that we are working through. Got it. Chris, any, any commentary on, on onshoring? Uh, I mean, one, one challenge we've had uh, is actually freight. So part of for this company that we're looking at in New Mexico, it's slightly cheaper than getting stuff over the Sierra Nevadas into Reno. Um, so we, we're going to see some benefit from that. Um, yeah, other, otherwise, I mean, it, it's still, we're finding out we still need to have a lot of the same bodies up in Reno. So it's not a one-to-one -one yeah. cost saving if you're looking to onshore. Yeah, it doesn't affect everyone, I mean, per se, as much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I guess we're near shore, but uh, onshoring, if we were bringing it back here, I mean, most of our manufacturing, I mean, it, it's just from a cost competitive standpoint, I, I know we have a competitor that builds a lot of their stuff, but we have um, for this specific company, a component that comes from Norway, it's extremely expensive. So you have to find other ways to kind of reduce the cost of your product. And uh, frankly, you know, we looked at something domestically and it was just much more expensive and couldn't handle the volume that we were looking for in, in a short turnaround time. Uh, compared to some of the suppliers out in um, in China, so you know that that's one where it'd be tough to bring it back. I mean, we do it for one-offs, um, but uh, just the, the scale that we're getting, um, despite the freight costs currently, we think those will come down. But um, you know, for otherwise, it, it's just hard to replicate it here at scale. And thanks for that, Chris. And I'll say, Jesse, back to you, like on, you know, high precision, highly engineered product, like walk us through what your world is like when it comes to, the, you know, to the onshoring aspects. Yeah, of what, so like, you know. Uh, you know, we have a couple of chemicals companies and advanced materials business. And in that sense, it's a really just a raw materials ability to add, to, to have access to them. Mm -hmm. um, some companies have done better because they, just have a supplier that's reliable and that's not as much involved with like the sort of global supply chain, what we're talking about here on our more sensors and instruments side of our business, you know, a lot of the parts are coming in from, from Asia. I mean, no surprise there. Um, but just to give you one specific example, we are under LOI right now with a business that is an advanced materials business that, um, makes parts that go into like a, a kiln that is uh, manufacturing an end ceramic product, right? So they're making products within that kiln. And, and that mm -hmm. 
the all the infrastructure money that's been going into you know the sort of economy from the bills that were passed, uh, the motivation given the chip shortage to get stuff moved on shore. We did a huge market diligence uh, sort of market report with one of our, our, our partners, and they came back with all kinds of data around the amount of different um, manufacturing that's going to be coming back on shore, specifically around what we were buying. And that gave us more, frankly, encouragement and more comfort buying this asset because, you know, the, the, I won't get into the details, but it appears as though it's going to affect at least one of our businesses in a very positive way. Um, you know, I think that there's some nice tailwinds on just the government sort of caring about not having take to chip shortages, right? Like mm -hmm. people talk, oh, that's going to increase, this, help our shift orders. That's going to 10 years, but like it's still going to help eventually with, you know, how we go about manufacturing cars or wherever the chips are going in. So, I mean, I think that there are beyond um, just the regular supply chain challenges, there's some, there is government money behind it, which really does also help uh, in terms of expediting how much is done onshore versus off. And so we're seeing that as a net net positive for, um, you know, for our businesses and manufacturing as a whole. Yeah, I mean, it ebbs and flows, right? Like back early 2000s, right? Like everything was going over overseas to low cost countries. How many times? Remember BRIC, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, right? Um, but, you know, ebb and flow now, you know, and all of a sudden here we are in 2022, we had a big virus called COVID. And yeah, they, I saw to say nothing out of that storyline as you guys just said, and really nothing that we see a ton of at Plant Moran um, is, is it's, it's, it's pretty favorable, I think, for North, North American based manufacturers, which I know most, most of us on this call are, are into. All right. Last topic I want to dive into, and then we'll just answer a question or two, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get out of here. Um, okay, so I'm actually going to shift this back to kind of the, so we heard all this like, good people stuff and a lot of ways that, you know, all of you guys kind of gave examples around what you, you know, what your companies are individually doing around that. You hear this buzzword ESG, right? So you have, you know, environmental, social and governance. And what does that mean? Some, uh, you know, one side is like, that is crap. That is, I don't need it. That is, uh, that's hokey. Others are like, we're going all in and there's a, and there's a whole lot of, there's a, the, the, the bandwidth is huge. So can you guys share like what, what you guys think about it? Um, Cause it's, it, to me in the world, especially like manufacturing, it, it, this is like one where there's, I feel like the bookends are very wide right now, what we're seeing versus other industries that would be probably more narrow. We probably have more adoption into it, but I said like manufacturer, there's some guys like screw that. I'm not going to do that. So um, maybe Shankar. Give yeah, us some thoughts. I'm, sure, I'm sure it varies by company too. For, for your 16 platforms. Yeah, ESG has uh, gotten a lot of focus and the priority has switched from what used to be something that we report to our LPs and GPs um, mm -hmm. and just a boardroom conversation to something on the floor. So what I mean by that is no more is it a compliance, but it's a culture change for us. So with that, we are talking about employees wanting to be in a company that they feel happy about. We want to be known as the employer of choice. We want to be known as a good corporate citizen. We want to be looking at what's our carbon footprint and what's our uh, you know, recycling and environmental initiatives. And now we've changed our organization where we've got ASR. Before we used to have a person in the plant that was responsible for EHS, environmental health and safety. But now we have someone reporting to the CEO that's mm -hmm. got ESG as, you know, there's not a, a person that's called an ESG director or whatever, but it's it falls under the CFO function or it falls under ops function that is now reporting ESG on a regular basis. So it's very much in the spotlight for us. And it can't be, and then HR has got to be right next to it, right? Exactly. Somehow, some data exactly. line org structure, right? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I'll, Jesse and Chris, I'd love to hear your thoughts, but I'll just say there is, maybe just to add a little bit more um, an added perspective, like there, there is, love to hear, again, John, the, your, the people side of it, but there also is the, the P&L side of it, where some that are really bullish on like, hey, like, yeah, car, like I'm going to actually do this to make more money. Like I, I want it because it's going to lower my, you know, I really think if I can get around, like my can truly like modify my cost structure to have like lower efficient, you know, or more efficient, uh, 
you know, utilities or whatever it may be that actually works. Like I'm doing this to make more money. Like let's, let's like not make, you know, call spade a spade. Others, I think other companies have a hard time getting around that. By the way, if, even if you can't make more money, you kind of, the people side, I think our perspective at plant is you can't not do it for the people side of it. Cause we are hiring gen Y and gen Z, not gen X and baby boomers anymore. So you, that is a big aspect. So Jesse, let me throw it back over to you. Yeah. I'd love any thoughts around that. I think you made an interesting, interesting point there. It's kind of like a, a, a win-win, right? Like if you're doing it to appeal to, you know, the new workforce coming in, well, yes. it, it's what they care about. And it's also helping your business. I mean, I, I'm hard pressed to find someone that doesn't want things to be more energy efficient, right? It's you care about the environment, okay. Or you're just saying from a dollars and cents perspective, like. But I think that Shankar touched upon an interesting point as it relates to our universe and M and A. Um, ESG is something that you got to be really careful about and how you publicize it with your LPs and GPs and the SEC as well. But you know, it, it's an easy thing to say that you're doing and, and um, adhering to all these you know standards and whatnot. But if you're not actually doing that in practice, like that can be a serious you know violation and misleading right. of for investors. And so. It's um, that has been something we had to really be mindful of because you know we did like a kind of an um, we bought a chemical company that had a some serious environmental risks to it and we did this whole huge like overhaul and it fixed it all it was a really you know frankly like pat ourselves in the back uh, improvement case study mm -hmm. and then when we actually trying to talk about it with people outside of our company it was like can't actually get into that really too much. Like it, it, it's kind of a, a loaded topic uh, when it comes to like the regulations kind of side of it. And so it's it's a, um, I kind of look at it in two camps, I guess, if I'm saying. There's like the, you know, really not exposing yourself to saying something that you're not, even if you are trying to do better. And also how you handle the ESG within a portfolio company. Um, we look at those as two very different animals and because two audiences you're really trying to satisfy the needs of. Got it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Jesse. That's yeah. There's yeah. It's a super debatable topic within a company, within an industry, certain industries are better for it. So yeah. Um, Chris, take us home. And I think we'll, we'll kind of end on here. If we've got any more final questions, uh, audience, please pop them in. I, we haven't anyone drop off. It's great. So don't let her, if you guys have questions, but Chris, take us home on the ESG side of the house. Yeah. Um, I mean, similar again, but we've, um, you know, it, it's one for us, at least in California, uh, especially the first fund with the mission statement being that we're investing in LMI zones and underserved markets. Mm -hmm. um, the governance and social elements of it were always pretty important. I mean, even the social, we've been asked to, to count head counts and uh, pay weight or wages for one of our investors for at least the last seven or eight years. So we we have some pretty decent data. We've been reporting back to our LPs the whole time in terms of job retention, job growth, uh, the mix of the workforce. Um, the, the challenge, I guess, for us has always been the environmental and just how you kind of standardize that among all your companies. I mean, we do an environmental review, of course, when we're going into a deal and we ask them to implement the uh, suggestions that come up. But beyond that, I mean, sometimes we're looking at companies that have 2 million of EBITDA or, you know, less than five. And so it's also very light on the management talent. So you might be dealing with a very light um, management team. And so mm -hmm. they just don't have the capabilities to implement a lot of these ESG practices. So we try and tailor it to what they can handle. And then with our LPs, we're, we're trying to be upfront about what we can actually do. Um, you know, we certainly will prioritize the social and governance side. Environmental, we'll do it when it's appropriate and what, when we can. But um, practically telling a lot of these companies that they have to determine their carbon footprint is just too challenging um, and too costly. And sometimes- yeah, Thanks, Chris. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes like, they're just not making money. And so we got to say, hey- Go away, right? Focus on the other stuff. And then we, once we can kind of get you back to solid footing, then we'll focus on um, profitability. But I mean, yeah. it, it's worthwhile. I, I think it is going this way. It's just, at least from what we've been seeing, we haven't seen any standards for ESG for investors. And so- Everybody likes to see you do it, but uh, you know there's no real standardized way of if you're doing it well or you're not doing enough. 
So I, I don't know, I guess if you were talking to an investor and they asked you, are you doing ESG? We have a lot we can tell them, but if they start saying, well, are you doing it to this level? We politely bow out probably on that one. Chris makes a great point. It's like, oh yeah, we want you to double your revenue. And at the same time, we want you to, to you know, improve every single, you know, environmental efficiency you can. And it's just, it's, it's, we're all, it's already a lot to ask when a private equity firm buys you, you know what I mean? And then you tack this on, you know, it's, it's, it's a tall order. And uh, I yeah. think that Shankar makes an interesting point about around hiring an actual person to manage that within the firm, um, you know, yeah, especially to, to Ted's point. I mean, you have some people who don't even believe in it, really. And you also may yeah, have somebody so who gets wide. compensated on a profit interest or some sort of economics tied to the returns. So you have to make the argument that, no, these environment, environmental measures that we're asking you to put in are going to lead to cost savings, energy efficient practices that will generate returns for you in the long run. It's it's a tough sell sometimes to some of the older school. And it really operators. depends. It really depends what yeah. subsector you're in. If you're manufacturing, but there's others where I think it's a clearer line. Um, okay, let's we have one more question coming in here. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. Uh no, th thanks for this, Scott. Um, I like this. This is about back to the little let's end on a good old like working capital. So uh with high inflation, rising interest rates, and concerns about an economic slowdown, are you taking any steps to adjust uh such as like inventory levels or capital structures? Uh, such as expanding debt facility availability. So that's a there's a lot in there, but um, let's just go like a minute a piece and we'll we'll kind of leave it there. So uh, Chris, you want to take that one first? Yeah, sure. Um, I for us at least, I mean, on the rising interest rates, we haven't seen it as much on the companies we're already invested in. Um, we've been able to get lines of credit, everything from the banks, uh, assuming the company's doing okay. Um, I would say the only change we've done really in the current environment, we've extended lead times on deliveries. Um, we just were having trouble hitting dates because of the uncertainty with supply chain. And then of course we've done price increases and um, we've added surcharges. So like a freight surcharge or a steel surcharge in another company that are expected to run off at some point. But right now it's covering a lot of the uh, challenges, I guess, that we're seeing. Thanks, well, quick fire. Uh, Jesse? So in terms of how it's affected us so far, similar to what Chris said, you know, uh, lenders hasn't been really affecting us yet. Obviously, this the, the uh, WR in place is not affected by that. Um, are we doing anything behaviorally different in terms of our analysis of different companies? I mean, depending on the business, um, I think one of them where, where we have kind of uh, I don't want to say stockpile, but but gotten some more inventory in when we have the opportunity to because supply chain challenges like if mm -hmm. it's there, get it, yep. buy it. Um, but you know, our companies by and large have not been that affected negatively. And as I say this, I'm like it's not the recipe for being flat footed and not being prepared, but um, you know, mm -hmm. as of now, we've been fair. Okay, so I'll, I'll say. From a plant perspective, plant Moran, we we definitely we've got a supply chain practice, and we like the inbound demand for oh my gosh, plant seventeen from client X Y Z is like I got inventory bloat, I can't explain it like that. That is a that's something we've seen more in the last six months. It's been probably a good, gosh, I don't know, seven to ten years since we've seen kind of that inbound come in. So when I saw the question come in, it's resonating on my side of the house. So Shankar, final word, my man. Um, I'll give you an inventory. example. So um, let's say we are looking at a company that's valued 10x, and typically we put 50 debt, 50 equity, and we would be expecting to raise 5x debt. So with this market environment, one, the debt levels are coming down. Let's say it's 4x, and the debt rates are going up. In another uh, world, we would have over-equitized and gotten the deal done, but now the valuations are under pressure. Right. So this is basically what we are seeing in our market at this point. But anything to think, let me, let me think too simple, but like off the financing side, but just on the, the racks in the, the warehouse around all the ah. portfolio, Shane Carr, like this. So yeah, I maybe right? very quickly touch on the SIAP process because the world is changing so much. When I say SIAP, the sales inventory order processing, 
and you're talking about so much variation and all your traditional working capital expectations of just in time and being there you know, on the high runners, there is no such thing as a high runner anymore. High runner is those frequent bars. Right. And then you always fill excess capacity with those you know, little runners where you can still get a twos and a singles. You know? um, so the problem is it is much more complicated and you have to plan by the day and minutes where previously you could just match unconstrained demand with constrained supply through your ERP system. And you could have an EDI that works great with your customers. But now it's real-time communications with the receiving clients and changing market conditions with competition and freight and all these other factors that, you know, what is going to be, what is going to be the next chip crisis, right? So we've just got to keep thinking about these types of problems. So yes, it is causing us to bloat up some inventories in some areas that we don't like it at all. Uh, but on the other hand, we can be shutting down our businesses as yeah, well. Yeah, it's a game of risk. Um, so why don't we uh, why don't we leave it there, um, guys? Thanks. This is fun. Um, I had fun. I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully, you guys had fun. Thanks everyone for hanging us on the panel. Have great uh, one on ones. Uh, Lena, do you need me to turn it back to you? Yes, please. Um, I just want to thank you all again for your participation. Our audience, of course. Uh, specifically Ted and all of you gentlemen on the panel. Thank you guys for facilitating such a great discussion. We hope you guys found value in this. We will be posting it to our YouTube in the next 24 hours or so. So keep your eyes peeled for that. We have a ton of events coming up, a few in person as well, one in Chicago um, and a couple in New York. So if you're interested in learning more about those, you know, get in touch with us. If you are participating in the afternoon meetings. You're going to want to log out of this link now and log into the separate link that was circulated by my colleague yesterday. Once again, thank you all so much. Uh, we hope everyone stays healthy and sane, and we'll see you all soon. Take care, everyone. Thank all right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Lena. Bye-bye.